Thanks everyone for joining us this morning. My name is Karthik and with me is David Reese and we both uh, work at Adobe. I'm a security researcher at Adobe and uh, David is a group lead with the Adobe Acrobat team. And uh, we're going to speak today about why we think developers and vulnerability researchers should uh, collaborate. So I actually wanted to start by doing a, a rough survey of this group here. Uh, how many people work in a security capacity either in research or a program management or some other capacity? So that's uh, 100 <laughs> percent. How many people work? Well, it's a moot question, but how many people work in development? None. So the, the idea behind this talk is uh, to tell you some, uh, about some of the collaboration that David and I have done together and how that's helped uh, make our security program better at Adobe. And uh, so David and I will share the stage and tell you more about what we did together. So here's the, um, here's the motivation for this talk. Um, if you've been following the news over the past few years, you'd know that the vulnerability counts in uh, Adobe Reader and Flash Player, our flagship products, have been going up pretty linearly. And um, this, is a, this is a graph to tell you how steep that increase has been. So then, you end up pairing up the objects. And of course, when, uh, when people are talking about bugs in company software, um, it, it does become a big deal because uh, the things that people say affect your product's reputation. These are some of the things that people are saying in the news about Adobe software. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, <laughs> the picture probably best summarizes the uh, state of security back then. But things have gone a long way. We've gotten a lot better at security. The team that does security at Adobe is called Asset affectionately called Asset. It's the Adobe Secure Software Engineering Team. And uh, the function that I've, I've primarily worked on is uh, called PSERT, the Adobe Product Security Incident Response Team. And so I'll tell you a little bit about what Asset does. So the mandate of Asset is to build Adobe software as securely as possible. And this is uh, working through all the stages of the software development lifecycle. And PSERT is part of Asset, but is focused on more on incident response. Um, so Asset's ambition or motivation is to uh, creates software as securely as possible, but uh, we know that no software is ever perfect, and as hard as we try, there will be bugs in our software. And so PSERT fills in that gap. And the way we work is as follows. We monitor the internet for reports of uh, bugs in our software, and some of these are emailed to us directly by, by customers or partners, and we monitor an email alias where we receive these reports. Uh, we work with product teams um, that are relevant, so if it's a bug in Adobe Reader, for example, We'll uh, engage the Adobe Reader team, send the bug report over to them, uh, collaborate with them on the analysis on the root cause, and um, help them create fixes and verify fixes. We do circle back with the researchers who submitted the bug, so they get an opportunity to verify the fixes. So in a, if they're satisfied with uh, acknowledgement, we add their name to our web page to, to indicate the work they've done with us, the collaboration. And then finally, we publish bulletins uh, to inform the public about the bugs that are getting mitigated with each cycle. Another project we've been involved with is a project called MAP, Microsoft Action Protections Program, and I'm glad some representatives from Microsoft are here. So I'm going to hand it over to, to David, and this is sort of how we'll pass the mic between each other and, uh, and uh, uh, proceed with the presentation. Here you go, David. Thanks, Karthik. So I guess I'm an endangered species here. <laughs> Be nice to me. Um, I'm part of the Acrobat 3D group, and that in turn is part of the Acrobat and Adobe Reader groups. So we're one of the teams that Karthik works with. Uh, it's about a billion users. The 3D group is more narrowly focused than that. We're dealing with ACCAT customers. We're doing automotive, um, aerospace, manufacturing industries. And we work with Asset and we work standalone. You saw from all the um, press clippings that Karthik gave earlier, um, we've been taking a bit of a beating. Um, our customers are high value, our data is complex, and that means you know they're rich pickings and it's a large attack surface. Um, in Acrobat 9, we started a code hardening initiative. Now, that was kind of in parallel with some of the clippings that Karthik was showing. Uh, so we are kind of proactive and reactive at the same time. Uh, that's morphed into the work, the ongoing work with Asset, where we identify and fix exploits, exploits internally. And we also try and look for problematic code patterns. We're leveraging developer knowledge and asset knowledge here to, to address those. And then, of course, the things you're probably more aware of, the 
reactive work with assets, the uh, public zero days, and also some um, non-public disclosed um, vulnerabilities where we work directly with high-value customers. And the Kothic. Thanks, after, David. Um, so now you know a little bit about Asset, what Asset does, and uh, okay. about Acrobat 3D and uh, the work that David does on that team. Um, I wanted to give you an outline of this talk, um, what's to come. We'll start by uh, telling you about MAP and the work we do in MAP. Uh, then ask the question uh, and, and give you some, um, some guidance on uh, what, the difference between a vulnerability and a bug. And really, it is the person who answers. Um, who, uh, the, answer, uh, the answer to those questions depends on who's answering it. We'll talk about some collaboration between David and myself on uh, some case studies. One on uh, what is a responsibly disclosed issue, uh, which had us to be in predictable timeline, and a couple of zero days, which uh, we collaborated on in December 2011. And then we'll cap it by sharing some lessons from these case studies and uh, hopefully um, um, help you answer the question why it is that developers and vulnerability researchers should collaborate. All right, so let's let's get right into it. Let's say Adobe software contains a bug. Now this could be any major software vendor, and uh, the bigger the vendor is, the more impactful a software bug is. And the vendor wants to protect its, protect its customers, and um, one way it does it by is by issuing updates. But of course, we all know that issuing updates, creating patches, testing patches, or deploying patches, um, represents costs both to the vendor and the last two stages, testing and deploying patches also represents costs to the en enterprises who are trying to protect themselves. Another uh, related aspect of that is that not all customers can update at the same time. Um, and that's related to complexities and uh, the nature of their environments and uh, the time it takes to test patches before deploying them. But the bottom line still is that Adobe or whatever big software vendor uh, we're discussing wants to protect its customers uh, regardless of uh, how quickly the, uh, the customers can patch. So MAP is, MAP is a program that helps fill that gap and solve that problem. Um, it's the Microsoft Active Protections Program. Um, and the way it works loosely is that um, Adobe generates vulnerability analyses and shares these details with trusted partners. And some of these are big names in the AV or security industry, Maxi, Symantec, and Avast. And uh, at last count, there were something like uh, 85 partners in this program who received this information. Upon receiving this content, these partners turn the details into security signatures. So um, the likes of Mac or Symantec might turn um, details about a vulnerability in, in Reader into a generic and precise proactive signature so that when exploits come out, then the signatures um, are proactive. And say a signature like that kicked in for an exploit file in the future, then via Symantec or via Mac or another company, Adobe just secondhand protected its customers. All right, so here are some more historical details about MAP and some other stuff that PCER does. MAP was actually a program that uh, Microsoft started back in 2008 and continues to today. And Adobe actually joined in uh, 2010. Um, so at the time, uh, our prominence as a software vendor who was getting hit by security bugs was large, and we contemplated creating a program of our own, but then decided to join Microsoft's program because it was successful. And we're still part of this program. Um, again, it's driven by PCERT, the team that does incident response within Adobe. And that team interacts with security researchers, the MAP team at Microsoft, product teams at Adobe, and customers. So I wanted to share some more details on what goes into this MAP content that is shared with partners. The first is a detailed description of the vulnerability. The second is a reduced proof of concept file. And the third is, in Microsoft terminology, something called detection logic. And I'll explain each of these in turn. But the idea behind sharing these three pieces, and this is something that Microsoft worked on, is that an, an analyst at a security company, um, when looking at these pieces in combination, would be, would be able to um, create security signatures because these describe um, what is needed precisely to um, write a signature for a security bug. So vulnerability description is exactly that. It's uh, sections that describe the vulnerability and aspects of the vulnerability, how to reproduce it, and so on. 
there are some uh, four four different sections in this document that's shared. Potential indicators of an exploit. So, say a file, a Adobe Flash Player, a Swift file, contains some data structures. What might those data structures be that indicate that the file is an exploit? Reproduction notes. Now, some of these bugs are actually difficult to set up an environment for and reproduce in, and it's helpful for analysts to have this information beforehand. So, reproduction notes help uh, speed up the process of reproduction of vulnerability. And detection guidance is uh, uh, a high-level description of uh, what an analyst should be thinking about when um, they write a signature for a security bug. A stack trace, as uh, vulnerability researchers will tell you, is uh, what's present on the stack at the time that program crashes. So, say an exploit file or a proof of concept file crashes Adobe Reader or Flash Player, what functions exist? Um, what could the analyst look for when they're trying to reproduce the same bug? Um, they might tell them that this is the very same um, vulnerability in action. All right, so some more details about this content. So when exploit files come into this program, um, into PCERT, they're, they're sometimes a result of uh, fuzzing runs. And so researchers might take files off the internet and uh, flip bits, whatever their methodology is for fuzzing. And uh, when they discover a crash, just send that same file to Adobe. Um, in MAP, we strive to reduce this file to as small a size as possible, make it as essential as possible so that the data structures relevant to the crash are captured, but other data structures are removed so that the analyst who's analyzing this vulnerability isn't distracted by irrelevant data. So in this example, the original file that came into Adobe PCERT was 54 kilobytes in size, and the file that we shared with partners was 24 kilobytes in size. And there's ways to do this um, using automation as well. Detection logic is a programming language type description of um, the uh, a potential exploit. So it's a pseudocode, if you will, that an analyst could study and then translate into whatever proprietary programming languages um, they write in, uh, their sec security signatures in, which would later be compiled into security content for their uh, antivirus scanner or IDS or HIPS or uh, what have you. All right, so how is this, how's all of this content generated from a process point of view? There are two teams within MAP, one, one called React and the other Defense, and uh, obviously things start with React. Um, and Adobe PCERT is on the side that receives these vulnerability reports, uh, actions them, and uh, filters this information out to the defense team. And Microsoft still remains the distribution channel for uh, this content when it's completed. The workflow is as follows. We start by processing crash reports. Um, sometimes this can be tedious because uh, only certain versions on certain platforms will reproduce the vulnerability, uh, but not others. So this is something we collaborate with product teams on so that they can also cut down the time it needs, uh, that's needed to reproduce a bug. And then uh, something that's shared between React and Defense is uh, analyzing the root cause. So uh, we both, the both teams start debugging and uh, reverse engineering, and uh, there's information flowing back and forth to uh, arrive at the root cause of a vulnerability. The defense phase also includes um, the creation of a reduced proof of concept file, like we discussed, and the chainsaw represents automation. If it had been an axe, it would be manual. And creating detection logic, which is a formulaic way of describing um, of, uh, how to detect the vulnerability, and that image uh, also captures that idea. And then all of this information, when it's when it's distilled, when it's precise, and when it's uh, completed, is uh, checked over once, and uh, then we share this information for the whole slew of vulnerabilities that are getting patched uh, one day before the release of the actual patches. So the calculation in that is that we want to give partners enough time to um, action on these, but we don't want to share this information too far in advance. So this slider here summarizes the entire process from going from a crash report in its raw state when it comes into Adobe PCERT to the final step, which is sharing this information that's uh, boiled down and precise with partners a day before the release of patches. Because uh, this is supposed to be an interactive session, uh, we'll pause after each major section. This is the first major section, and do um, you have any questions so far? Can we prove by propagating them up that they meet? Right.
have the same value at that and at some point in the program. So the second part of it is um, giving you some of the lessons we've learned um, working on this stuff from, from in the trenches um, and sort of tell you why it is that a bug isn't the same as a vulnerability because of who's asking and who's answering. You're always going to be merged together. Okay. And the thesis is that security researchers and attackers on one hand and developers on the other hand view security bugs differently. The image on the left here is a, a screenshot of, or a picture of the uh, Go San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge when looked at from the south side. How many of you have actually seen this bridge? All right, interaction, I like it. So any, any San Francisco native would tell you as I would that um, the two bridges are the same. And the image on the right is the same bridge from, um, looked at from the north side. A naive observer might state that uh, these are two different pictures, two different bridges, but we know better because it's the same bridge that looked at from two different angles. So I, I hope to apply this analogy to how developers and researchers have different views of the same thing, security bugs. And if he sits in the middle where the bridge between the two parties, we have to translate um, between source code, exploits, POCs, and uh, even the terminology. So it's like being interpreted between these two different languages. The and a lot of it is managing communications between the two down, parties. So when you're doing your propagation downward, you keep a set of live bits. All right, so and then when you have giving you some backdrop about background about map and uh, told you about some of the work that goes into communications between the parties involved in, in map. Um, for the rest of this talk, we'll focus on case studies, stuff uh, stuff that PCERT has done and uh, stuff that we've collaborated on with uh, David's team. We'll start by this incident, CV 2011-2438. And for each of these, we'll, we'll give you a similar format of description, and we'll start with a timeline as this. Uh, this, is a, this is a vulnerability in Adobe Reader. Um, the original disclosure came into PCERT on September 6, 2011. And um, the, the stages that are described in this timeline um, are, are common to all the case studies we'll examine. Triage, which is uh, trying to reproduce the bug and figure out what platforms and what versions the bug reproduces in, started immediately. So PCR jumped on this, and we shared some of his work with the Adobe Reader team. Um, and once, once we were satisfied with it, other stages continued. So in this case, the email that came into PCR reporting this stated, and I quote, we have received a vulnerability report from a third party researcher regarding vulnerabilities in Adobe Reader 9 and 10, and contact you on his behalf to attempt a coordinated disclosure. Um, it's interesting to note the, the language in some of these reports, because uh, it tells you what the researcher is thinking. So triage, as, as I said, started on the 6th of, um, 6th of September, and, um, and then we had to work on other things. So we returned to the bug on the 29th of September, um, went, went about our business, and then we had a question for David on the 9th of November, which he answered very quickly. So with his help, we were able to wrap up analysis, vulnerability analysis for MAP the week after. And then uh, the release of the patch, um, the, the patch was um, um, released in, in conjunction with other patches, and it was for regularly scheduled cadence release on the uh, 10th of January, 2012. So I want to cut into some of the work that the PCER did in the triage and map analysis stages in that timeline. So we verified the crash report on the latest product versions, and uh, for vulnerability management teams out there, obviously, uh, a lot of teams will have labs set up with older versions and later versions, and one of the methodologies to verify that a submission is actually uh, a new vulnerability is to see if the, the file that was shared crashes the product on the latest version of the product. So we did this and shared the uh, POC with product teams, who then have um, a more tedious task of testing all the supported versions of the product. And when they're successful in uh, reproducing the bug important versions, um, they log the bugs and then uh, assign developers to fix the bugs. Now, sometimes it isn't as smooth. You know, so, uh, they wouldn't be reproduce, uh, able to reproduce the vulnerability on a certain version, and there's some back and forth between PCERT, the QE team, and the researcher to, to, precise, to get down precisely what changes to reproduce the bug. But let's say let's, uh, that went smoothly, and it did go smoothly in this case. Developers were assigned, and actually it was David who worked on those bugs. Then from the PCER point of view, um, we have a slew of bugs to get through, so once this was triaged, we added it to our work list with the plan of uh, returning it to later when other items have been addressed. So we did that exactly. We worked on other stuff through September and October. 
When time came to continue working on this, um, I pinged David on November 9th of 2011, and uh, with the feedback uh, he gave, I was able to complete the analysis of the bug the week after, and uh, that, is, that effectively uh, completed what, we, what is needed for this bug, and uh, we continue with map analysis for other bugs. And the patch was scheduled for January 10th, and uh, because of the nature of the bug, this was a responsibly disclosed vulnerability, and we had good communications back and forth with the researcher. The patch was indeed released as planned on uh, the 10th of January, 2012. So this is a steady and predictable timeline, and um, that's usually the characterization of uh, responsibly disclosed vulnerability. So before I give it over to David, uh, I wanted to bring up this timeline again and uh, tell you, um, ask you to think about what happens on the developers end after the bug is done. So. Um, the, the 6th of November, well, September was when um, product teams and PCERT completed the triage of the bug. And um, so what happens on, on the developers and what, what David did after that point in the time frame indicated by the arrow enabled him to give feedback to the researcher. So his response to me was immediate and, and correct because of the work he'd already done analyzing and fixing the bug. With that said, let me hand it over to David. and. You know, theoretically, you know, you could find here and then a couple procedures down in the call stack, it should be you. And then it suddenly becomes a variable in all of those frames <coughs> as it propagates. So, basically, it's a Yes, the, the two zero days we'll, we'll discuss, we'll cover that. Thank you. So I'm going to head over to David, and uh, he'll tell you about the work he did in that red time frame. Thanks, Karthik. Okay, so the first, you know, Karthik pings us, or someone else in asset. Um, we know it's not a zero day, we have time to consider it. And also, there's a, a ton of information that asset provides with that. Uh, we have the stack, the safe proof of concept file, um, bug descriptions. What we have to do with that is there's still some layer of translation that's required. Um, partly because Acrobat is a work in progress. We're always modifying the code, fixing other bugs, adding other features. So we want to be able to map um, the vulnerability that's been discovered to the latest code base. Is it already fixed? Uh, or where does the vulnerability occur in the, in the latest code? So we narrowed down the issue. Oh, you know, one interactive bit. Uh, you let me know if you need any more detail on the vulnerability itself or anything else. Um, there were two related failures going on. We fixed both of them. Uh, one was in an image file format, BMP. There was a negative width, width test that was nicely crafted um, to basically um, write file all over um, memory allocated for other structures. Um, we fixed that, but even with that, there was some failure handling. Um, some of this BMP code, it's not necessarily Adobe code. We have to have interfaces between it and the other libraries. Um, so we had to um, have better reporting so that the parsing could be aborted and the user could be informed that there was some malicious content in there. And we handed that off to Asset. Uh, a lot of discussions going on between Asset and us. We try and follow up on this bug, not just the considered instant fix, but also what similar issues there might be in other areas of the code. And we can leverage both groups for that, because ASIC can have their perspective on looking at it, and we can have our perspective looking at both the assembler in C++ and of the architecture itself. Now, it's an image file format, so uh, that was easy. A uh, good place to look is other image file formats. Uh, in all of these four, we found at least that there was an issue with reporting back the problem um, to Acrobat itself and then managing failure. So we fixed all of those. Another aspect is that um, there was one particular parameter which was crafted to cause memory issues. Um, uh, image formats have width, they have depth, height, all kinds of other parameters. So we, we did an analysis on all of those different things to figure out which ones could possibly cause exploits. And in several of these formats, we addressed those issues. 
a lot of regression testing. Um, one of the things from a development viewpoint and, and also a developer customer relationship viewpoint you see is that sometimes customers can actually be relying on problems in files or they may not even be aware that they're there. Acrobat, because it's so widely, and, and Reader, because it's so widely deployed, um, it has to do far more testing and has to be far more code hardened, say, than the application that generated the file in the first place, especially if it's an image file format. And customers may, be, um, may have created a lot of content already, which has you know, problematic values within it, which just survived, happened to survive our code in the past. So we have to do a ton of regression testing to make sure this doesn't break existing customer workflows. Now to Kothic to characterize zero day. So Rob's question actually, we'll, we'll talk about the timelines for two different zero days and um, that'll, that'll tell you what was different between the zero days and um, the responsibility to code issues. So the first zero day we'll discuss was CV 2011-2462. And the original submission came into PCERT on December 1st. And it was an ominous stroke message. Looks like a zero day. Exploits reader 946. And um, obviously, we treat zero days with the highest urgency and priority. We dropped everything else and uh, started triage, started map analysis, and uh, threw it over to the development team, who also started looking at it the very same day. And so on the different parties continued working on it, and the patch was uh, actually scheduled for sooner than the 16th, but uh, we were actually hit with another zero day. So we, after a lot of agonizing decision making, we pulled the patches together and uh, together released a common patch on the 16th of December. So let's review the steps in the triage and vulnerability analysis from the PCR point of view, or asset point of view, for the zero day. As with the responsibility disclosure issue, we had to verify the, the crash. And once we were able to get a crash on the latest version of um, Adobe Reader, we shared it with the product teams. Um, one aspect of this was we were able to craft um, an exp a file that was just a POC without any attack code, without any JavaScript code. So the developers and QEs who aren't set up with uh, environments that are um, hardened for security testing will be able to work on it without infecting their computers and uh, possibly spreading mal malware on the uh, network. And I'll, I'll stop here and, and also add a word about uh, automation systems that help to speed up our triage. So in examining this exploit, one of the things that was doing was throwing down a file on disk. Um, the name of the file was d39caps.bat. And uh, so when you're, in, when, when you're in the midst of triage, there's all these competing tasks that need your attention. Uh, so the question I had to ask myself was, do I spend time pulling this file apart, or do I continue debugging and try to get to the root cause of this bug? And this is where automation stepped in and, and um, helped us uh, accelerate the um, uh, working on important things. So uh, at, in PCERT, we actually built what you could call, I guess, an internal uh, virus total tool. It's an array of uh, parallel antivirus scanners. So we emailed this tool, um, the file that was dropped by this exploit file, and uh, the result we got back was that the exploit was that this file was clean. And um, you know, we took that at face value for the time being, and we did follow up with it later. But the, the, the analysis returned by the AV products was helpful in us uh, ramping up and focusing on other things. And later, we did do the due diligence of returning to this file and then running other files that had the same embedded file format, U3D. And then noticing that any U3D file in its process of um, being opened up by a reader would drop the same uh, uh, file, and uh, it, they were all obviously benign. But when you're in the midst of um, taking apart a zero day, things like this can be distracting, and automation helps you focus on the important things. So I said a minute ago, we also created a safe POC, and it was essential to do this as quickly as possible. Um, and it's not always very easy, because uh, if it's a complex attack, uh, there are many uh, um, paths through the exploit file as it's running through a platform product. And uh, creating a safe POC, if it's possible in, in quick time, then um, we uh, are able to throw it over to the product teams quickly. Another artifact that was very helpful in uh, the security team's analysis of the bug was the notes that the developers were sharing with each other. Um, even, the, even extracts of their emails with, they were passing with each other, even to be CC'd on the emails and communications between the devs was uh, very helpful for us and uh, let us gain insights into the root cause of the bug. 
And this is a point that I made on the slide with the timeline spread. The patch was originally scheduled for sooner than the 16th, but um, as uh, luck would have it, we were hit with another zero day. So we um, finished up the work on this and uh, pulled together both patches and did a combined patch on the 16th. So I'm going to hand it back to David, and he's going to tell you his perspective on working on the zero day. So how do you know? Thanks, Karthik. So always a, a tense time being a developer. You get a note about a, a zero day. There's no time. This should have been fixed yesterday. Uh, different from the prior bug, what we're doing is we're discovering the nature of it in parallel with ASSET from our different viewpoints. And that means there's a lot of communication going back between the two teams on the nature of the bug from these different perspectives. Um, we have an example file. It may be potentially unsafe because Asset hasn't sanitized it yet. So from a developer's perspective, that can be quite problematic. Our systems are usually pretty open. We're grabbing source code because we want the latest code. Um, there's a lot of gateways open. Um, so this involves extremely careful handling of the bug. Um, uh, luckily, we had a, a fix the day we were notified. And I, I guess that was in part because we nailed it down to the U3D format, or, or ASSET did before we even got it. Um, that's one of the two 3D file formats that um, PDF supports. Um, because I happened to have um, drafted part of the spec for it, I could pretty quickly get to the area of the file that was causing the problem. Uh, 3D is modular. So one of the things we could do was build just the component where the failure occurred and pass that to Asset. Uh, they could drop it into an existing copy of Reader or Acrobat and verify it's fixed. And because their systems, are, you know, they're much more used to dealing with unsanitized files, they could do far more testing than we could on it. And another complexity here was that there was a JavaScript issue. Basically, um, JavaScript in the PDF was actually um, causing infin infinite loops or other malicious um, behavior. And we didn't know initially. I mean, is this uh, an aspect of the same bug? Is it something different? We had a lot of discussion with the asset team over this, because they were doing most of the work in characterizing the JavaScript part. Um, by sharing all that information and also by passing the pre-compiled U3D library to them, we could pretty quickly determine, OK, these are two separate issues going on here. Now, in, in this case, it's important to follow up. We've come up with this fix really quickly. Um, it has a, an impact on the customer because it's a, it was a bug in materials usage, and pretty much every 3D file um, uses materials. So we're just going to end up with a black screen. Uh, what we have to do then, because of this risk of customer impact, again, this thing of are they relying on um, files which may have been problematic in the past, we have to do a lot of testing. And we also limited the deployment to the A9 out-of-band installer. I think that was in part because the vulnerability, the actual attack in progress, was in Acrobat 9. That was the logical place to put it. A10 also has some mitigations already in place. Um, as I mentioned, lots of aggression testing on that, not with the proof of concept file, but with other files that we had available with similar content. So we could try to ensure it didn't break any customer workflows. Unfortunately, in this case, it did break a customer workflow. So it was a really obscure case where um, just a few people had some files where there were no materials in them. And we were now incorrectly reporting in Acrobat 9 that that was a, a malicious file. So one thing is because we deployed A9 early and we could get that feedback early from the customers, we could release a more complex fix um, for the A9 regular dot release and also A10. Um, which address that issue. So to Kothik, regarding zero day. Thanks, So we've seen an example of one responsibly disclosed issue and another example of uh, responding to a zero day. And I thought it's appropriate to um, interject a slide about why zero days are different. Uh, so with the regular bug, we have more time and we can think more about how to make the fix as robust as possible within the constraints. But with a zero day, we don't have that luxury. We have to make decisions um, with a lot of stress and uh, under duress, if you will. One of the zero days, the, the first zero day that David just mentioned required a follow-up. And um, because a few files were broken, the subsequent fix was introduced in the next major release. And zero days also make us think really hard about whether 
Milwaukee, it's good to share POCs or exploits at a certain time. So with a response to this code issue, which has no attack code, it's a no-brainer. We share it with the development teams freely, and we want the file to be available to any product team member or quality engineer who's doing any testing with that file. But with the zero day, we have to we have to draw a line, and if um, it's not possible to reduce that exploit file into a safe POC, which just crashes the platform and does nothing else, then we do actually make the decision to share that file with the developers with the strong caveat that this should be only debugged on an isolated machine. Or in some cases, if it's an exploit that uh, targets Windows only, then please debug on a Mac. And we'll, we'll discover that th this is what uh, we instructed David to do on uh, the, the second zero day we'll talk about in a minute. Any questions up to this point? So the second zero day we had to contend with was CV 2011, 4639. The first one had come into PCERT on December 1st, and this one was on December 9th. So the picture of us working furiously at fixing this and testing this, and as we're just about getting ready to pat ourselves on the back, boom. <laughs> so as in the first zero day, we started analysis from every angle, triage, map, and um, developer response as soon as possible. And uh, we pulled the patches together and released a common patch on the 16th of December. As with the first zero day, uh, the submitter has an ominous, succinct style in writing about this exploit. The ex this exploit is Reader 946, but it appears to be a different issue. So we follow the same process in the vulnerability triage and analysis stage. Um, we appreciated that creating a safe POC in this case would take very long because it was a more complex attack. Um, and we told David, here, look, this is the best we can do with the time we have. We'll continue taking this uh, file apart and reducing it and making it as safe as possible, but please debug on a Mac in the meantime. As with the first zero day, and the emails that are flying between the developers helped in recause analysis. Also, because this is a very complex format, we really needed his help. And as David said, he's, he's one of the uh, people who drafted the spec, so his expertise and background in the spec was very helpful in us understanding the file format and how that led into the actual crash. And this is a point that you've heard me make before, but both patches were pulled together for the 16th. Now back to David for his view. Hey, thanks, Karthik. So, yeah, just like Karthik, we're exhausted, but like breathing a sigh of relief from the first vulnerability, and then along comes this one. And it's obviously not related. Um, again, we get this stack file from asset proof of concept file. Also, the invaluable information about um, it's safe to debug on the Mac. Um, that really helps because then we can go at the bug, you know, we can go debugging really quickly on the Mac. There's no caution required. This case, it was in the second of the two 3D file formats that PDF supports, and that's PRC. Now, one thing with PRC is that some of the maintenance for the code um, is ongoing with a third party, a firm in France. And so we have to basically launch an around of the clock investigation on this. We've got the, the US talking with India, we have a group there, talking with France, back to the US again, and all the while Acid and Acrobat communicating. So there's just this like, huge deluge of emails and voicemails going on. A lot of overlapping discussions. We're trying to stay away for as long as possible so that we can have meaningful discussions. It's not just a ping handoff to the next person. That helped a lot. Um, by plus 24 hours, we've got a proof of concept file from Asset, which has the JavaScript stripped. So you know that allows us to figure out, OK, if we make a fix, is it really a fix? Like Acrobat isn't hanging or crashing anymore. And by 48 hours, we've nailed it down to the, the point of origin, where in the file format is the issue, and actually directly address the bug. So you can see it's, it's gone around a couple of times around the world. Again, follow up. Uh, by 96 hours, we've got a full safe proof of concept file. That means we can start debugging it properly on Windows, making sure the fix applies there, or what modifications are required to it. Yeah, so the much wider platform analysis. It also means that we can start testing on other versions. I mean, we started with Acrobat 9, and we spread out, OK, is this an Acrobat 8 issue? Is it a 10 issue? Uh, validate the fix again, as before. You know, there could be some customer issues with this and some agonizing discussion because we'd already delayed the patch once to deploy the U3D fix. 
do we delay it again to deploy this fix? Um, that, the other patch, you know, there are other fixes in that patch as well. So again, it helps a lot of feedback from Acid over what the severity of the bug is, um, the conditions of the exploit. That helped us decide, yeah, it was worth delaying again. A lot of regression testing. This um, problem was in, uh, was in geometry reference, which is again another core piece of 3D file formats. So a, a ton of files had to be tested on various platforms. Unfortunately, in this case, there was no follow-up customer, Im customer impact on their workflows. And to Karthik for lessons learned. Thanks, David. So in the next next few slides, we'll we'll sum it up, um, sum up what we learned, and uh, tell you why it is why, why we think it's great that we collaborated. Um, I think it's it's fairly clear that uh, the combined expertise of uh, David and his team and the, the expertise in our team um, helped us get to the bottom of the zero days quickly. So in both cases, the attacks were complex, and uh, in in the second zero day, for example, there was a JavaScript loop. And the certain versions only were targeted, and uh, the security people really helped um, uh, inform the Acrobat team as to how to go about dealing with with um, this complexity. And the other side of it is that uh, we relied on David and his team heavily for uh, informing us about uh, the speci specifics of uh, the file formats. So from working together on on a few responsibly disclosed issues, and I just gave gave you one case study. Uh, the, the working relationships between David and myself and the two teams were in place already, so our response to the two zero days was quicker and more streamlined. And in parallel, the work that uh, David was doing, uh, partially informed by Asset, in uh, proactively fixing similar bugs, variation analysis, I think it's called, um, helped us find, in the interim, another U3D bug post the first zero day. So David found that and fixed that. And this is only possible because of uh, his background in the format and his awareness of uh, working on security issues. So I'm going to hand it back to David for one last time to tell you about best practices. Thanks, Kovic. OK, so what do we learn? Um, it's always good to follow up on a tight deadline. You're making a fix. It's you know, doing it in 24, 48 hours. It's never going to be perfect. There are always going to be some customer issues to address at some point. And the fix has to be so small, so tight, to get into something like a patch, be a proof for a patch. Usually it requires some embellishment, some expansion to make it itself more robust. It's better to detect zero-day issues. I mean, it really is better to detect zero-day issues before they occur. Oh, boy, after what we've been through. Um, so toward that end, um, Asset is this um, great repository of techniques, tips, feedback that we can all draw on for future bugs. And from a product perspective, um, when we're trying to fix our own bugs, even if they're not vulnerability bugs, security bugs that are you know, um, non-zero days, we're still looking for around, you know, in that local area of the code, is there some problem nearby that we should be fixing at the same time? Addressing zero days starts long before the zero day itself, and there's a long tail afterwards. So um, prep beforehand, things that Karthik mentioned, um, like the creation of the automation that that was invaluable to him to like rule out the .dat file. Uh, other aspects, things like um, uh, Asset creates training modules for developers. I found those invaluable myself, and a lot of other people have too. And for as far as the long tail, oh sorry, first let's talk about duplication. So when you're in a zero-day situation, it's extremely stressful. There's a lot of communication overhead. There's a lot of discussion about the same topics from different perspectives, different people. Some of that's unavoidable. I, I personally find a lot of that very helpful because you're getting someone else's perspective. It's almost like you know, you're doing white box and black box testing at the same time and sharing the information in real time with each other. I think that's a big help, I mean, especially with things like, say, that JavaScript issue. We didn't know we fixed the thing. It's still broken. What the heck's going on here? So having you know, Karthik and other people's perspectives on that really help. Uh, part of the long tail, uh, we added a choke point to the 3D component and some other high-risk components. So in Acrobat 9 now, if you have a file, if you encounter a file which has 3D, you'll actually get a yellow bar which will request, um, do you trust this? Do you want to really, you know, go and look at the content of this file? Um, and some 
enterprise level policies where they can turn on or turn off this particular content by default. I mean, for um, aerospace companies, it would be really useful to have it turned on, and usually they don't share files very often externally to the organization. Um, for some, like an, an accountancy firm, I mean, who needs to see 3D? And finally, um, finding similar bugs. A lot of variation analysis. It's ongoing work, working with asset and standalone to, to just look at the overall architecture, look at existing vulnerabilities, see if there are any patterns already there or being introduced that could be problematic. And to Karthik to conclude. Thank you, David. So to sort of sum it up, um, once again, through the process in place with uh, David's team and, and our team, um, we were able to generate vulnerability analysis that were um, successful for map partners to be able to generate security signatures. So users who were able to patch the patches we put out were protected, obviously. And other users who, whose environments were being uh, tested, if they were able to deploy the signatures that the partners created, they were protected because the signatures would be in the middle between an exploit and a vulnerable app. So through the collaboration between David and myself and our teams, we were able to successfully protect um, our users. So with that, I, we hope that we've made the point that developers and vulnerability researchers should collaborate. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, we'll take any questions you have. Yes. So as um, one of the one of the things that the security team tries to do is spread its net as wide as possible. So David mentioned uh, briefly the trainings we put in place. So um, we have uh, in working with our business units and in management, we've mandated that every product team has a certain percentage of engineers signed off that they're trained to a certain level. So the security is already on the radar and they're aware of it. Um, so that's one way of um, us getting a foothold. Um, in, in their teams. And uh, later when we engage developers um, eat, um, from, the, from the reactive side, uh, it's mainly over email, then I try to follow up by meeting the person and, and establishing rapport with them. And uh, the researchers who work on the proactive side uh, are part of uh, developer meetings and QE meetings. So they're effectively consulting security team members part of these different teams. So we sort of try to anticipate um, problems and communications and we work hard on ironing them out. Any, anything to add? Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, I mean, definitely getting a good working relationship with the security team. That's critical. I like, um, had a lot of exchanges with Karthik before. I knew who he was. I knew it was like, okay, this is important. I should deal with it immediately. Um, from like the management perspective, I mean, one thing we did with Acrobat 9, um, you know, we wanted to, to harden the code internally ourselves. So we sold it to our management as this is a feature. It's like, you know, you deploy Acrobat 9. I mean, why buy Acrobat 9? Because it's hardened. It's like for a lot of orgs, that's uh, an attractive feature. Okay, so um, dev group, there are about 100 developers in Acrobat and Reader. Uh, about like maybe um, 70 of that is engineers and maybe it's like 30 QE and, and plus like various layers of management on top of that. So by proxy, we have... Uh, we have our spies and all, no. We, we, we have people interested in, in security who we develop through these training programs. So by, by proxy, we have security interested and trained um, engineers on every team. Uh, but the, the team we work on directly, people whose sole function is security, the team is about 20 people. Uh, so I, we, we could define what a zero day, how we define a zero day. Sure. Um, a zero, the way we define it, I guess, and feel free to disagree. Um, it's a vulnerability for which there's a working exploit in the latest version of supported product. So say the latest version of... Any other questions? 
done with, uh, without any human intervention. The whole point. If we were to actually be looking at these things, it would be, be a violation of our customer stuff. So we don't do that. Yeah. Like, and also for there it is. Because that's part of our contract that we're never going to look at this stuff. Um, and that the decompilation process to generate something machine readable that generates the result without actually generating the code code. Right. Um, so in, in those cases, um, we sometimes we do release it in advance. Uh, but for resp responsibility of closed issues, it's, uh, it's a more steady process. You're right. Yeah, we if we can share exploits before um, with trusted partners, we do. If we can share analysis with, with trusted partners, we do. And sometimes it's a work in progress, and any information we can stream out to them is helpful. And we're going to decompile it and start. Okay. Anything else? Well, thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.